Hello, welcome to VMC. I'm Dr. M. Today we are going to cover vaccines. Um, we'll talk a little bit about why they are given, when they are given, how the body responds to them, and special considerations for dogs as well as for cats. Join me, you'll learn something. It's important that we understand the first immunity a puppy or kitten can receive is from their mother. So all of the moms are hopefully vaccinated before they give birth. When the puppy or kitten first nurses, the milk that they get, it, we call colostrum. That's because the colostrum is full of antibodies that the puppy and kitten is able to absorb through their GI tract for the first roughly 24 hours of life. And that is how they get immunity to protect them when they're very, very young. Now, of course, this means that there's going to be a huge variety in how well these puppies and kittens are protected. As time passes, this maternally derived immunity, or MDI, will decline. We have no way to test each individual animal to know precisely when it declines from being protective to no longer being protective. We just know that this happens between, say, 4 and 12 weeks of age, on average, for most pets, depending on species. Cats might be losing their immunity from their mom earlier than our dogs do. And when the puppy or kitten has maternally derived immunity, this will prevent them from properly responding to the vaccines that we're giving. And so that's why we keep boostering until the last injection is given after the animal is 16 weeks of age. Now there are some breeds of dog that seem to have a harder time with immunity. And so uh, for black and tan dogs like Rottweilers or Dobermans, there's a few other breeds as well that your veterinarian might talk to you about. Those animals are recommended to be given one extra dose around 20 weeks of age. It's also important that we understand a little bit about how the immune system responds to the vaccines that it receives. So there is a species specific amount of vaccine that is required to trigger the immune system into forming antibodies. Now this is very important to notice that I'm saying this is species specific. It has nothing to do with the weight of the animal. I liken this response from the immune system to a little bit like a light switch. It's either all the way off or all the way on. You need to give the light switch enough force to flick the switch all the way on in order to get the light bulb to work. It's the same with the immune system. We need to give it enough of a trigger that it switches fully on in order to get the antibodies that we're looking for. And so this is why giving half doses of vaccines is incredibly irresponsible. It is wrong to do. It's not safer for the animals in any way. And it means that they will not be properly protected from the things we are trying to vaccinate against. So next we need to talk about white blood cells. As a whole, these are the cells that are responsible for a lot of the immunity in the body, and we can categorize them into a few different subtypes. Macrophages will engulf and digest dead cells that they find that are not part of the body, and they will leave behind the antigen for the other white blood cells to come by, recognize, and start forming antibodies against. The B lymphocytes these are the ones that produce the antibodies that will attack the antigens. Antigens are somewhat virus specific and that's the part that the body recognizes and remembers for if it ever sees it again. And then we also have T lymphocytes and they will attack infected cells and they also are a part of the memory cells so that if uh, an animal has seen a certain virus in the past, they will remember what that virus looked like so that in the future the immune response can be stronger and faster in order to protect the animal as much as possible. So a vaccine will trigger the T lymphocytes to produce antibodies. 
and then the T and B lymphocytes will have memory of that virus so that in the future they are ready to protect against any future infection. Now it's very important to note that the initial response to any new sort of virus or disease is pretty slow. It takes a, a good 10 to 14 days and so that is why it's important to not consider a pet fully protected until 14 days after they receive the last vaccine in their series. Now, it does vary from disease to disease and from vaccine to vaccine how long the body will remember a particular disease and how long it will stay immune to that disease. And so it's not really possible to make a, a sweeping statement here. So boosters are necessary both because of potential virus mutations over time, but also because immunity will decrease over time. Very important that the vast majority of the population is protected this helps to protect those that are non-responders or those that are unable to be vaccinated because of other rare disease processes. It also helps to protect humans because the people can get diseases like rabies and Bordetella and others from our pets. And so having the pet population vaccinated is crucial in protecting people from getting diseases from their pets. Now it's very important that any adverse events are reported, so if you notice anything, make sure to tell your veterinarian about it. Um, it is fairly common after vaccines for a dog to be tender in the area where they were vaccinated. They could also have a little bit of a bump in that area for a while. They might get a little bit tired or lose a bit of appetite or be a bit under the weather, sluggish, you know, for a day or so. That sort of a response is considered acceptable. Um, however, if they are quite painful, some dogs do need pain management after vaccines. If you have a cat that develops a lot of nausea or doesn't want to eat after vaccine, you can ask your veterinarian for a medication to prevent nausea like Serenia, and you can give it a few hours before the vaccine appointment and that can help a lot. Other dogs might have a bit more of a reaction. They might have vomiting or diarrhea or hives or swelling. In those cases, before future vaccines, it's important that we give a steroid and an antihistamine. True anaphylaxis is incredibly rare. What I mean by that is a life-threatening reaction. Let's talk a little bit about dogs specifically. The AHA recommendations currently have distemper, adenovirus, parainfluenza, and parvovirus, as well as rabies, as the core vaccines that every dog should be vaccinated for. However, there are also a bunch of vaccines that some animals will need and others won't depending on geographical location and lifestyle risk. Now let's talk about our cats. The current AHA recommendations for cats is to vaccinate all of them for feline leukemia virus, for rabies, for Khaleesi virus, for herpes virus, for panleukopenia, and then there's possibly other vaccines depending on your geographic location that may be included. Then we have some recent research um, and the WSAVA and AHA are now recommending that cats receive one booster at six months of age of their combination vaccine as there seems to be a significant portion of cats that need that booster as they're not properly protected after their kitten series. Cats do have one other risk factor for all injections that we just don't see in our dogs. And so this is a feline injection site sarcoma. Now, it's not associated with only vaccines. You could see this after any injection. There is a lot of research in our cats about this, and the risk of developing a tumor after an injection is somewhere between 1 in 10,000 and 1 in 30,000. Because of the potential of a feline injection site sarcoma, it is very important that vaccines are given as low on a limb as possible or as low on the tail as possible. This is because in the rare event of a tumor formation, um, 
these tumors are pretty aggressive and so we would end up needing pretty aggressive resection around the tumor. And so if the injection is given low on the leg or on the tail, that enables us to do that and provide a good chance of survival and excellent quality of life for the cat. This is why we do not vaccinate cats in the scruff area anymore. And we also don't vaccinate you know, over the shoulder, or over the hip. I'm going to give a special note for rabies on its own because it is such an important thing that we talk about. Depending on where you are geographically located, there will be a varied amount of rabies present in the wildlife and the species that it is present in will also vary. In some places it's raccoons, in other places it might be bats, it could be any species. And so vaccinating for rabies is something that is often legally required. This is because our pets are a connection between wildlife and humans. And the thing that makes rabies such a serious topic is that it is almost always fatal. And for this reason, vaccinating our pets for rabies is very, very, very important. That's why there's a lot of legislation around the rabies vaccine. Your veterinarian is instrumental in helping you to understand which diseases your pet is most at risk for, and then providing vaccines on an appropriate schedule for them based on where you are located and the risks of your individual lifestyle. But the vaccine appointment is more important than simply for that injection that your veterinarian gives. At this appointment, we are also doing a physical exam and we will be able to catch disease processes earlier. And it's also at these appointments that we will be able to dispense tick prevention, flea prevention, heartworm prevention, treat for intestinal parasite risks like roundworms, whipworms, hookworms, tapeworms, and on and on it goes. So these appointments are much more than a vaccine appointment. It truly is an overall like health and wellness appointment that is very, very important for your pet. All right, I hope that you have enjoyed the video today. Please like the video if you've learned something and comment your ideas for future video topics. I love to hear from you and I love to get feedback on what you found helpful and not helpful from the information that I share. I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Bye for now.